Hello, good day. My name is Mohammad Hanif Naim bin Mohammad Dani. I'm a student in the Management and Science University. Today, I will be presenting you on the human skeletal system under the subject of organization of the human body. These are the topics that I'll be covering today. First, I'll be talking about the functions and type of bones. Secondly, I'll be talking about the bone formation. Now, thirdly, I'll be talking about the division of skeleton. And final but not least, on the mechanism, the differences, and any additional information of our skeletal system. Now, let's start. Let's look into the function. Bones or osseous tissue is a hard, dense connective tissue that forms most of the adult skeleton that supports structure of the body. In the areas of the skeleton where bones move, cartilage, a semi-rigid form of connective tissue, provides flexibility and smooth surfaces for movement. The skeletal system is the body system composed of bones and cartilage and performs the following critical functions of the human body. It supports the body, it facilitates the movement, it protects internal organs, produces blood cells, stores and releases mineral and fats. Now let's look at the type and the classification of bones. Now, the 206 bones that composes the adult skeletons are divided into five categories based on their shapes. Their shapes and their functions are related such that each categorical shape of bone has a distinct function. Now let's look at the first bone, a long bone. A long bone is one that is cylindrical in shape, being longer than its wide. Keep in mind, however, that the term describes the shape of a bone, not its size. Long bones are found in the arms such as the humerus, ulna, radius, and legs as well as in the fingers and the toes. Long bones function as levers. They move when muscle contract. Now the second bone will be the short bones. A short bone is one that is cube-like in shape, being approximately equal in length, width, and thickness. The only short bones in the human skeletons are in the carpals of the wrist and the tarsals of the ankles. Short bones provide stability and support as well as some limited motion. Now let's look at the next bone, the term the flat bone. The term flat bone is somewhat of a misnomer because although a flat bone is typically thin, it is also often curved. Examples include the cranial, our bone, our skull bones, the scapulae, the shoulder blades, the sternum, breastbone, and the ribs. Flat bones serve as points of attachment for muscles and often protect internal organs. Now, the next bone will be on the irregular bones. An irregular bone is one that does not have any easily characterized shape and therefore does not fit any other classification. These bones tend to have complex shapes like the vertebrae that support the spinal cord and protect it from compressive forces. Many facial bones, particularly in the ones containing sinuses, are classified as irregular bones. The final bones will be the sesamoid bone, bones. It's a small, round bone that as the name suggests is shaped like a sesame seed. This bone forms in tendons, where a great deal of pressure is generated in a joint. The sesamoid bones protect tendons by helping them overcome compressive forces. Sesamoid bones vary in number and place them from person to person, but are typically found in tendons associated with the feet, hands, and knees. The patellae are the only sesamoid bones found in common with every person. Now that we understand the types and the function of bones, let's look into the next slide. Now, next, we will be talking about the bone formation and the development. In the early stages of embryonic development, the embryo skeleton consists of fibrous membranes and hyaluronic cartilage. By the sixth or seventh week of embryonic life, the actual process of bone development, ossification, begins. There are two osteogenic pathways, the intramembranous ossification and the endochondral ossification, but bone is the same regardless of the pathway it produces, that produces it. Now let's look at the intramembranous ossification. During intramembranous ossification, compact and spongy bones develop directly from the sheets of mesenchymal connective tissue. The flat bones of the face, most of the cranial bones, and the clavicle are formed via intramembranous ossification. 
The process begins when mastinkable cells in the embryonic skeleton gather together and begin to differentiate into specialized cells. Some of the cells will differentiate into capillaries, while others will become osteogenic cells and then osteoblasts. Although they will ultimately be spread out by formation of bone tissue, early osteoblasts appear in a cluster called an ossification center. The osteoblasts secrete osteum, which calcifies within a few days as mineral salts are deposited on it, thereby entrapping the osteoblasts within. Once entrapped, the osteoblasts become osteocytes. As osteoblasts transform into osteocytes, osteogenic cells in the surrounding connective tissue differentiate into new osteoblasts. Now, osteoid secreted around the capillaries results in a trabecular matrix, while osteoblasts on the surface of the spongy bone become the periosteum. Now, the periosteum then creates a protective layer of compact bone superficial to the trabecular bone. The trabecular bone crowds nearby blood vessel, which eventually condense into red marrow. Now, intramembranous ossification begins in utero during fetal development and continues on into adolescence. At birth, the skull and clavicles are not fully ossified, nor are the sutures of the skulls closed. This allows this sorry this allow the skull and shoulder to deform during passage through the birth canal. The last bones to ossify via intramembranous ossifications are the flat bone of the face, which reach the adult size at the end of the adolescent's growth spurt. Then the next ossification will be on the endochondral ossification. In endochondral ossification, sorry, in the endochondral ossification, bones of the by replacing hyaline cartilage. Cartilage does not become bone. Instead, cartilage serves as a template to be completely replaced by new bone. Endochondral ossification takes much longer than intramembranous ossification. Bones at the base of the skull and long bones form via endochondral ossification. In a long bone, for example, at about 6 to 8 weeks after conception, some of the mesenchymal cells differentiate into chondrocytes that form the cartilaginous skeletal precursor of the bone. Soon after the perichondrium, a membrane that covers the cartilage appears. Now, as more matrix is produced, the chondrocytes in the center of the cartilaginous model grow in size. As the matrix calcifies, nutrients can no longer reach the chondrocytes. This results in their death and the disintegration of the sur surrounding cartilage. Blood vessels invade the resulting spaces, not only enlarging the cavities, but also carrying osteogenic cells with them, many of which will become osteoblasts. This enlarging spaces eventually combines to become the medullary cavity. As the cartilage grows, capillaries penetrate it and this penetration initiates the transformation of the perichondrium into the bone-producing peristeum. Here, the osteoblasts form a peristeal collar of compact bones around the cartilage of the diaphysis. By the second or third month of fetal life, bone cells dilute and ossification ramps up and creates the primary ossification center, a region deep in the peristeal collar where ossification begins. While these deep changes are occurring, chondrocytes and cartilage continue to grow at the end of the bone which increases the bone's length at the same time. Now, bone is replacing cartilage in the diaphysis. By the time the fetal skeleton is fully formed, cartilage only remains at the joint surface as articular cartilage and between the diaphysis and epiphysis at the epiphyseal plate, the latter of which is responsible for the longitudinal growth of bones. After birth, the same sequence of events occurs in the epiphyseal regions, and each of the centers of activity is referred to as a secondary ossification center. Now let's look at how bone grow in length. The epiphyseal plate is the area of growth in a long bone. It is a layer of hyaline cartilage where ossification occurs in immature bones. On the epiphyseal side of the epiphyseal plate, cartilage is formed. On the diaphyseal side, cartilage is ossified, and the diaphysis grows in length. The epiphyseal plate is composed of four zones of cell activity, the reserve zone, the proliferative zone, the zone of maturation, and the hypertrophy.
most of the chondrocytes in the zone of calcified matrix and the zone of closest to the diaphysis are dead because the matrix around them has calcified. Capillaries and osteoblasts from the diaphysis penetrate this zone and the osteoblasts secrete bone tissue on the remaining calcified cartilage. Thus, the zone is calcified matrix connects the epiphyseal plate to the diaphysis. A bone grows in length when osseous tissue is added to the diaphysis. Now, bones continue to grow in length until early adulthood. The rate of growth is controlled by hormones, which will be discussed later. When the chondrocytes in the epiphyseal plate ceases, their proliferation and bone replaces the cartilage. Longitudinal growth stops. All that remains of the epiphyseal plate is the epiphyseal line. Now, let's look at how does bone grow in diameter. Now, while bones are increasing in length, they are also increasing in diameter. Growth in diameter can continue even after longitudinal growth ceases. This is called a positional growth. Osteoclasts resorb old bones that lines the medullary cavity, while osteoblasts, by intramembranous ossification, produces new bones tissue beneath the parasite. The erosion of the old bone along the medullary cavity and the deposition of new bone beneath the peristium not only increases the diameter of the diaphysis, but also increases the diameter of the medullary cavity, which is called modeling. Now let's look at bone remodeling, the process in which matrix is resorbed on one surface of a bone and deposited on another is known as bone modeling. Modeling primarily takes place during a bone's growth. However, in adult life, bone undergoes remodeling, in which resorption of old and damaged bones take place on the same surface where osteoblasts lay new bones to replace that which is resorbed. Now let's look at factors that may affect uh, out the growth. So there are a few factors that will affect the growth of our skeletal system, such as we need an adequate amount of minerals such as calcium, phosphor phosphorus, and magnesium, and vitamins A, C, and D. Now, there are all these types of fractures. There are different types of fracture. A fracture is a broken bone that will heal whether or not a physician resets it in its anatomical position. If the bone is not reset correctly, the healing process will keep the bone in its deformed position. Now, when a broken bone is manipulated and set into its natural position without surgery, the procedure is called a close, re a close reduction. Open reduction requires surgery to expose the fracture and reset the bone. While some fracture can be minor, others are quite severe and result in grave complication. For example, a fractured diaphysis of the femur has the potential to release flat gold wounds into the bloodstream. This can become lodged in the capillary beds of the lungs, leading to respiratory distress and if not treated quickly, death. Let's look at the type of fractures. There are closed fractures, open fractures, transverse fracture, spiral fractures, commutative fracture, impacted green stick and oblique fractures. Now, have you heard of calcium homeostasis? What is calcium homeostasis? Well, calcium homeostasis refers to the maintenance of a constant concentration of calcium ion in the extracellular fluid. It includes all of the processes that contribute to maintaining calcium at its set point. Calcium is not only the most abundant mineral in bone, it is also the most abundant mineral in the human body. Calcium ions are needed not only for bone mineralization but for tooth health, regulation of the heart rate and strength of contraction, blood coagulation, contraction of the smooth and skeletal muscle cells, and regulation of nerve impulse conduction. The normal level of calcium in the blood is about 10 mg. When the body contains maintain this level, a person will experience either a hypo or hypercalcemia. Now that we are done with the bone formation and development, let's look into the vision of skeleton. Now, the skeletons are divided into two different types, which is the axial, axial, and also the appendicular.
Now, the exoskeleton is the part of the skeleton that consists of the bones of the head and trunk of our vertebrae. It consists of 80 bones and it is composed of six parts. The skull bones, the ossicles of the middle ear, the hyoid bones, the ribcage, sternum, and the vertebral column. Now, we will go through this one by one. Now, let's start with the skull. Sorry. Let's start with the skull. Now, the cranium sc or the skull is a skeletal structure of the head that supports the face and protects the brain. It is subdivided into the facial bones and the brain case or cranial valve. The facial bones underlie the facial structure, form the nasal cavity, enclose the eyeballs, and support the teeth of the upper and lower jaws. The rounded brain case surrounds and protects the brain and houses the middle and inner ear structure. In the adult, the skull consists of 22 individual bones, 21 of which are immobile and united into a single unit. The 22nd bone is the mandible, which is our lower jaw, which is the only movable bone of the skull. Now let's look throughout all these bones, parts, and labels. Now let's look at the anterior view of the skull. The anterior skull consists of the facial bones and provides the bony supports of the eye for the eyes and structure of the face. This view of the skull is dominated by the openings of the orbits and the nasal cavity. Also seen are the upper and lower jaw with their respective teeth. The orbit is the bony socket that houses the eyeball and muscle that moves the eyeball or open the upper eyelid. The upper portion of the anterior orbit is the suborbital margin. Located near the midpoint of the suborbital margin is a small opening called a suborbital foramen. This provides a passage of a sensory nerve to the skin of the forehead. Below the orbit is the infraorbital foramen, which is the point of emergence for a sensory nerve that supplies the anterior face below the orbit. Inside the nasal area of the skull, the nasal cavity is divided into halves by the nasal septum. The upper portion of the nasal septum is formed by the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone and the lower portion of the vomer bone. Each side of the nasal cavity is triangular in shape with a proteinferous space that narrows superiorly. When looking into the nasal cavity from the front of the skull, two bony plates are seen projecting from each lateral wall. The larger of this is the inferior nasal concha an independent bone of the skull. Located just above the inferior concha is the middle, middle nasal concha, which is part of the ethmoid bone. A third bony plate, also part of the ethmoid bone, in the superior nasal concha. It is much smaller and out of sight, above the middle concha. The superior, sorry, the superior nasal concha is located just lateral to the perpendicular plate in the upper nasal cavity. Now, a view of the lateral skull is dominated by the large rounded brain case above and the upper and lower jaws with their teeth below. Now, let's look at the brain case. The brain case contains and protects the brain. The interior space that is almost completely occupied by the brain is called the cranial cavity. As you can see here, now, the cavity is bounded superiorly by the rounded top of the skull, which is called the calvaria. And the lateral and posterior sides of the skull, the bones that form the top and sides of the brain case are usually referred to as the flat bones of the skull. The floor of the brain case is referred to as the base of the skull. This is a complex area that varies in depth and has numerous openings for the passage of cranial nerves. Now, blood vessels and the spinal cord. Inside the skull, the base is subdivided into three large spaces called anterior cranial fossa, middle cranial fossa, and posterior cranial fossa. Fossa by means a trench or a ditch. Now, from the anterior to posterior, the fossa increases in depth, and the shape and depth of each fossa will correspond to the shape and size of the brain region that each houses. The boundaries and opening of the cranial fossa will be described in a later section. Now in this figure is a sphenoid point. 
It's a singular complex bone of the central, sorry, of a central skull. It serves as a keystone bone because it joins with almost every other bone of the skull. A sphenoid forms much of the base of the central skull and also extends laterally to contribute to the side of the skull. Now let's look at a sample of the adenoid bone. Now the adenoid bone is a single midline bone that forms the roof and lateral walls of the upper nasal cavity and the upper portion of the nasal septum and contributes to the medial wall of the orbit. On the interior of the skull, the ethmoid also forms a portion of the floor of the anterior cranial cavity. Within the nasal cavity, the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bones forms the upper portion of the nasal septum. The ethmoid bones also form the lateral walls of upper nasal cavity. Extending from each lateral walls are the superior nasal concha and the middle nasal concha, which are thin curved projection that extend into the nasal cavity. Next, we will look into just a certain information where it has a unique feature of the skull. Now, there are unique features such as the suture, which is an immovable joint between skull bones and paranasal sinuses, which are located in the bones near nasal cavities. Now next, we'll be talking on the vertebral. The vertebral column is also known as the spinal column or spine. It consists of a sequence of vertebrae, or vertebra is a singular, each of which is separated and united by an interval disc. Together, the vertebrae in interval disc form the vertebral column. It is a flexible column that supports the head, neck, and body and allows of the movement it also protects the spinal cords, which passes down the back through the opening of the vertebrae. Now let's look at the regions of the vertebrae. Now, the vertebral column originally developed as a series of 33 vertebrae, but this number is eventually reduced to 24 vertebrae, plus the sacrum and the coccyx. The vertebral column is subdivided into five regions, which the vertebrae in each area named for that region and numbered in descending order. In the neck, there are seven cervical vertebrae, each designated with the letter C, followed by its number. Superiorly, the C1 vertebrae articulates, forms a joint, with the occipital condylate, sorry, condyles of the skull. Inferiorly, C1 articulates with the C2 vertebrae, and so on. Below this are the 12 thoracic vertebrae, also part of the, sorry, thoracic vertebrae, designated as T1 to T12. The lower back contains L1 to L5, lumbar vertebrae. The single sacrum, which is also part of the pelvis, is formed by the fusion of five sacral vertebrae. Similarly, the coccyx or tailbone result from the fusion of four small coccygeal vertebrae. However, the sacral and coccygeal fusion do not start until age 20 and are not completed until middle age. An interesting anatomical fact that is that almost all mammals have seven cervical vertebrae, regardless of the body size. This means that there are large variation in the size of cervical vertebrae, ranging from the very small cervical vert vertebrae of a shrew to the greatly elongated vertebrae in the neck of a giraffe. In a full-grown giraffe, each cervical vertebrae is 11 inches tall. Now let's look at it at the different sections. So we have the cervical vertebrae. We have the thoracic part, which is like labeled from T1. Next we have the lumbar, as what I've explained. And then we have the sacrum and the coccyx vertebrae. Now let's talk about the thorax. Now, the thoracic cage or the rib cage forms the thorax or the chest portion of the body. It consists of the 12 pairs of ribs with the coastal cartilage and the sternum. The ribs are anchored posteriorly to the 12 thoracic vertebrae, which are labeled as T1 to T12. The thoracic cage protects the heart and the lung. Now, in the middle, you can see there is sternums, 
Now, the sternum is the elongated bony structure that anchors the anterior thoracic cage and you will find ribs. Each rib is a curved flattened bone that contributes to the wall of the thorax. And these ribs articulate posteriorly with the T1 to T12 thoracic vertebrae and mostly attach anteriorly via their coastal cartilage to the sternum. There are 12 pairs of ribs. The ribs are number 1 to 12 in accordance with the thoracic vertebrae. Now let's look into the next division of skeleton. Now we will be talking about the appendicular divisions. Now, appendicular skeleton includes all of the limb bones plus the bones that unite each limbs with the axial skeleton. Now, the bones that attach each upper limb to the axial skeleton form the pectoral girdle. Now, we're looking at the shoulder girdle here. This consists of two bones, the scapula and clavicle. The clavicle or the collarbone is an S-shaped bone located on the anterior side of the shoulder. It is attached to its middle end of the sternum of the thoracic cage, which is part of the axial skeleton. The lateral end of the clavicle articulates with the scapula just above the shoulder joint. You can easily palpate or feel with your fingers the entire length of your clavicle. Now, however, the scapula lies on the posterior aspect of the shoulder. It is supported by the clavicle, which also articulates with the humerus, the arm bone, arm bone to form the shoulder joint. Now, let's look into the next division, which is the pelvic girdle. Now, the pelvic girdle or the hip girdle is formed by a single bone, the hip bone or the coxal bone, which serve as an attachment point for each lower limb. Each hip bone, in turn, is firmly joined in the axial skeleton via its attachment to the sacrum of the vertebral column. The right and left hip bones are also converged anteriorly to attach to each other. The bony pelvis is the entire structure formed by the two hip bones, the sacrum, and attached inferiorly to the sacrum, the coccyx. Unlike the bones of the pectoral girdle, which are highly mobile to enhance the range of upper limb movements, the bones of the pelvis are strongly united to each other to form a largely immobile weight-bearing structure. This is important for stability because it enables the weight of the body to be easily transferred laterally from the vertebral, sorry, for, from the vertebral column through the pelvic girdle and hip joints and into either lower limb whenever the other limb is not bearing weight. Thus, the immobility of the pelvis provides a strong foundation for the upper body as it rests on top of the mobile lower limb. Now, let's look at the upper limb part of the division. Now, as you can see here, we have the upper limb. As you can see here, the upper limb is divided into three regions. This consists of the arm located between the shoulder and elbow joints, the forearm which is between the elbow and wrist joint, and the hands which is located distal to the wrist. There are 30 bones in each upper limb. The humerus is the single bone of the upper arm. And the ulna medially and radius laterally are the paired bones of the forearm as we can see in the slide. The base of the hand contains eight bones, each called a carpal bone, and the palm of the hand is formed by five bones, each called a metacarpal bone. The fingers and thumb contains a total of 14 bones, each of which is a phalanx bone of the hand. Now let's look into the lower limb part of the body. Like the upper limb, the lower limb is divided into three regions. The thigh is that portion of the lower limb located between the hip joint and knee joint. The leg is specifically the region between the knee joint and the ankle joint. Distal to the ankle is the foot. The lower limb contains 30 bones. These are the femur, patella, tibia, fibula, tarsal bones, metatarsal bones, and phalanges. The femur is a single bone of the thigh. The patella is the kneecap and articulates with the distal femur. The tibia is the larger weight-bearing bone located on the middle side of the leg. And the fibula is the thin bone of the lateral leg. The bones of the foot are divided into three groups. 
The posterior portion of the foot is formed by a group of seven bones, each of which is known as a tarsal bones. Whereas the midfoot contains five elongated bones, each of which is a metatarsal bone. The toes contain 14 small bones, each of which is a phalanx bone of the foot. Interesting, isn't it? Now we're coming to an end of our presentation. So before that, let's look at the differences of um, in the skeletal system. Now, what are the mechanisms and the differences of information of a male and a female differences? As we can see here, the woman, they would have a smaller frontal bone, they will have a smaller temporal bones, smaller mandible, and in the ilium part, they are more flat. Pelvis is tipped forward, causing greater curvature of lower spine, and they have larger rounded pelvic inlet. The center of gravity is for both male and female different differs in a very small amount of distance. Although for female they will have shorter long bones and they will have increased Q angle in the patella. Now in the aging and skeletal system, but to adolescents there are more bones formed than loss. About young adults gain and loss about equal. As, se as level of sex steroids decline with age, bone resorption will reduce as bone formation, and bones become more brittle and lose calcium. That is all for my presentation on the human skeletal system. I hope you enjoyed my presentation, and thank you very much for listening till the end.